Morning, Tony. Good morning, McGraw. Good morning, Kelly. How's Hi, everybody Tony. Doing? So th- well, I'm watching this Paul McKee story with, with great interest because people forget um, he was sued in court for four years uh, while trying to assemble some land together to sort of redevelop North City. And um, ultimately, he's the reason why they were able to piece together enough land for the mapping agency, which is well on its way to clearing the land. And now all of a sudden, uh, the city wants to cut ties with him and Josh Hawley wants to sue him. So what's, what's going on here? Well, it's, it's a complicated story, but if you look at the last few years, there's, you know, there's, there's a little bit on both sides to, to, to wonder about. First of all, some of the criticisms against Mr. McKee and his development are fair. He bought a lot of properties and let them sit and didn't board them up and didn't mow the lawns and didn't, did, did a lot of stuff secretly, and that earned him some ill will in some of the north side neighborhoods uh, that he was dealing with. But at the same time, while he's trying to create large-scale development in a community that has been ignored uh, for decades in St. Louis, the, the, the same government groups and political officials that approved this concept, this vision, take him to court and fight him every step of the way. And, and so this is just a really complicated story. But ultimately, the city politicians have decided they've had enough of him. They believe that, that he has failed. They believe that what he's doing is fraudulent. And uh, so they're going to end up in court. What, what I think the city needs to be worried about a little bit, uh, I haven't looked at Josh Hawley's lawsuit yet, so I, I, I don't have a judgment yet on the overall merits of that, but Paul McKee's attorneys have a pretty darn good track record of winning their legal battles. And that's where all of a sudden now you have a north side area that's been ignored. Maybe Paul McKee was the wrong guy. But in the city's current action, what it's done is set up the north side to be ignored again for some period of time during the time post-NGA decision in which there ought to be all hands on deck trying to make something happen up there. And so it, 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 it's a, you know, who knows what's going to happen in the next few days. If they really think they have the goods on McKee and they can get him to roll over and they can find some other favored developer to go in there, you know, then we're going to go through this process all again because nobody builds in distressed communities without tax incentives. And so if indeed Paul McKee's the wrong guy, who's the right guy and what incentives are going to be offered then, and what sort of political battle are we setting ourselves up for in the next five or six years, and is the real victim the north side of the city of St. Louis? I do find it interesting, the criticism of Paul McKee was that he was b- buying up this this land and uh, in not doing anything with the land and, and not telling anybody. Well, of course, if you're trying to redevelop an area and you're trying to amass uh, plots of land, you're not going to go on the radio and tell people because you don't want to artificially inflate the prices of the properties you're, you're trying to buy. Yeah, and, and that's the irony of what a lot of this dispute is about. What the city says is that because of this recent eminent domain lawsuit over uh, the Buster Brown building, they discovered for the first time, the city says, that Paul McKee was paying some overinflated prices for some of the properties that he bought. And because of the nature of those deals, they believed he was doing that in order to increase the amount of tax credits that he received. Well, part of the problem there is that they misunderstand the whole concept of the state legislation that allowed those tax credits to exist. They existed precisely because in order to get one person to create this large piece of developable property, they were by nature going to have to overpay for some of those properties. That's why, at least in concept, those tax credits existed, understanding that there was going to be overpayment, that somebody was going to have to take a risk that nobody had been willing to make for decades and decades and decades. 
And now all of a sudden, because the NGA has happened, apparently, according to the city, all sorts of other developers are willing to line up because there's no risk right now. Right. Uh, and and, and oh, it's a it's not a story where a lot of people on on any of the sides look particularly good it is true though would you not agree that if paul mckee didn't assemble these plots of land this nga would not be be be, be built now because there just wouldn't be enough land oh i agree you know it, it's funny i was watching on twitter yesterday and and everybody's trying to take credit for nga uh the one thing that everybody should be able to agree on based on the facts is that paul mckee is the person who is most worthy of the uh, uh, praise or or credit or whatever for making sure that the NGA stayed in St. Louis. That's that's just what history will show. Now, whether or not that can be treated separately from does he have some other problems with his properties and does he need to be held to account, et cetera, I think that's a separate issue. But there's no doubt that without Paul McKee assembling that land, the NGA would not be in North St. Louis. That's an interesting story. Well, we'll talk more about this later on. But this airport privatization story uh, now back in the news, what, the city has agreed to what, the next step in this conversation? Basically, the city has agreed to allow uh, uh, a Rex Sinkfeld group to pay for and direct the process by which they will seek requests for proposals uh, to potentially privatize our airport. And uh, finally, uh, after months, they voted on and released the contract that, that they have uh, signed with, with multiple consultants, but all of them in some capacity connected to Sinkfeld's Grow Missouri group. Um, Here's the interesting thing that I see. I, I see an, an amazing juxtaposition between the McKee story and the airport story. Paul McKee, 10, 20 years ago, was the shiny object, the silver bullet. This is the big thing that's going to save St. Louis. And now, literally within 24 hours, on the time that they're cutting ties with McKee, saying, well, that didn't work. That's, that's not what we're going to do. We're going to sell the airport. We're going to lease the airport. We're going to privatize the airport. Our new shiny object is Rex Sinkfeld and whatever multi-billion dollar international companies come in to, to, to win the contract uh, to siphon cash off the airport. I mean, it's, 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 it, it is to some degree 24 hours that gives us a look at the history of St. Louis. Yeah. Uh, not to mention that they kept... Paul McKee in court for four years, suing him so he couldn't develop anything for four years, and then complain that he didn't do anything for four years after they were suing him. So, Well, and, and, and there's no doubt this airport deal is going to end up in court in some capacity. I mean, it, it is a complicated deal, and when the city basically signs off its, its authority to private individuals and lets them completely underwrite public uh, business basically the the uh, I know they're going to get mad at me for saying this, but metaphorically the selling of the city's biggest asset. Um, it, it to me that is not very good government and it's not open government. Tony Messenger, we'll talk more about it as we uh, continue on Tuesdays and Thursdays with us. STLToday.com. Tony, have a good week. Thanks. Good to talk.